Hi, Michelle, and welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. I'm so thrilled that you're with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. I'm thrilled to be here. Excited to chat. And you have quite the story to share. You have had an experience growing up with a mom that has ex was ill at the time and that has shaped not only your childhood, but your adulthood and you're taking that and learning from it and growing from it and using that as a teaching point for others. And I really admire that in you. And I'm really thankful that you're going to share some of that wisdom with us. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, telling my story is, I guess there's a million places that I could start, but I'll start um in childhood, um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and uh, it was not typical in that I grew up with my dad. My dad raised me primarily. Um, nowadays, it's not so uncommon, but in the 70s and 80s, I had no friends. Actually, in my immediate circle that even came from a broken home, much less a home where the father was the primary parent. Mm. Um, so it was my dad, my brother, and I. and um, I lived with him my entire life until I moved out of the house as a young adult, except for a very short stint when I was around four, um, where I did stay with my mom. And I stayed with my mom for a little bit while my father got his ducks in a row after they separated. And my dad had my brother and I was with my mother. And we stayed with my dad's youngest brother, which was also very an awkward setup, but I loved it. I enjoyed my time there because I got along really well with my dad's youngest brother. So um, my memories of it were fond. Uh, and then I went to stay with my dad once he kind of had all of his affairs in order, so to speak. And my dad continued um, raising my brother and I. I am uh, four years older than my brother. So um, he was six months old and I was four parents parted ways. So um I've always given kudos to my dad. He was 25 and he had a four-year-old, a six-month-old baby um, under his wing. <laughs> wow, yeah. I think about the 25-year-old me and I don't know that I could have managed. I give the man complete credit for um, raising two functioning adults. Um, so after I, I moved uh, back to my father's uh, house, we didn't really hear much from my mom. Mm -hmm. And... She would disappear from months at a time, weeks at a time, uh, and no one really talked about it. No one really said anything. No one really explained what where she was or what she was doing or why she wasn't around. It was all very hush hush. So, my brother and I were fairly young and didn't really ask any questions. We just eventually accepted it as the norm. And when mom came around, came around. That had to and be then cold, though. I would imagine it was. It's, it was difficult in that we had friends with both their parents. And so I, that's when my resentment towards my mom started as a kid is, you know, why can't I have my mom around? Like my, mm. well, my girlfriends had their moms around. They go shopping, they go out for lunch, they go do all these girly things. And I wasn't a girly girl. I was very much a tom tomboy. I, you know, climbed trees, played sports and, you know, but still would have liked to have that side. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, um, like all girls want, right? <laughs> um, but fortunately, she did come around occasionally. And when she started coming around occasionally when we were children, um, we noticed that she still wasn't like other moms. And there were just things that were different. She was a little bit more eccentric. Um, she smelled like alcohol oftentimes. Um, she acted very bizarre. And we didn't, again, being kids, we didn't know what to do about it and we would never say anything to our father about it because we didn't want to upset him or upset the apple cart so we just kind of let things lie and i recall even when i was as young as like eight and nine years old taking a bus from one city to another by myself um to toronto ontario i live in southern ontario and getting off the bus and getting in a taxi <laughs> by myself at what i go see my yeah 
eight or nine. <laughs> wow. And what I don't even know how, how this was arranged, but when I would get there, um, there would be a taxi driver and come up to me and ask me if I was Michelle. And it'd be, yeah, well, your mom sent me here to take you to her office or apartment or the restaurant that she was at. And I remember thinking, wow, I'm so cool. Um, but I think back now, I'm like, no, that not, not cool. Um, and again, I never told my dad that because I didn't want my mom to get in trouble. I didn't want to get in trouble because I felt like I was doing something kind of, I don't know. I felt weird about it, but I didn't know why. Um, Kids internalize things like that. Yeah. They do. They do. Yeah. And then as a teen, uh, I recall snooping, as teens do, in uh, my father's closet. I was looking for, I don't know, Christmas presents. It was change. I don't know. I was a shameful, angsty, rebellious teenager. And I kind of knocked over a box and... I saw a bunch of files and being the nosy teenager that I was, I looked inside of them and um, came across some custody and divorce papers about my mom and my dad's um, separation, divorce and custody. And I went through them and eagerly devoured all of them. My dad and my brother, I think, were out um, at one of my brother's hockey games. And I couldn't believe it because I saw it there for the first time. Um, and I don't. 100% know even how old I was, but I saw um, mental health issues and depression and bipolar and schizophrenic. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't know what any of this meant, but I knew it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have Google then. <laughs> so, so I kind of just, you know, went into a bit of a, I, I don't know what this means, but it's kind of starting to explain why she's so different and she's not there. And I knew she, I figured she was an alcoholic, but I just thought, well, that's, you know, not as uncommon and, and, you know, not that it's not a big deal. It is a big deal, but having this on top of it, I, I didn't know what to do with it. So, um, I tried to figure out what I could and tried to find out what I could very quietly and didn't really tell any of my friends because I was so embarrassed. Um, I grew up in the suburbs and the stigma was incredible then and so it was quite a I kept that world then than it is now it sure was it sure was and I internalized that as well so I went through and wasn't angry but confused and nervous and I just didn't know what to do with that information um so I figured that if I just didn't have her around my friends or didn't involve her socially and just kind of kept her at arm's length unless I wanted to include her in some things, because on the other hand, she was also the cool mom because she did drink and she lived in the city and she didn't have parenting skills. So if I was being rebellious, I could take one of my, you know, 14, 15 year old friends and she would take us to a bar, not knowing any better. Um, and we would have some drinks with one mom with some random folks at a bar downtown Toronto on a Friday night. Um, and my friends and I thought this was the coolest thing ever. Um, I hope none of the parents are watching or listening to this because they probably get really angry at me even still. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then uh, my aunt passed away. So throughout my life, my mom's oldest brother kind of looked over him, her and watched over her and made sure that she was okay and got health care when she needed it and didn't really involve myself or my father or my brother and and. My father knew what was happening, but he never spoke negatively about her. He always kept his thoughts and his opinions to himself. Wow. So we hadn't developed or, or decided how we felt about it because we didn't hear anything negative or positive. Um, That's a and gift. That's a huge gift. It, it really is. It really is. And it's, it's, you know, in hindsight, my dad did a whole lot to make sure that my brother and I grew up to be healthy, functioning human beings. Based on the genetic hand we've dealt, it could have gone a very different way, um, as we've learned um, over the years. But when my uncle Pat, or not my uncle, my aunt, my uncle's uh, wife passed away suddenly when I was 19, he had a conversation with me um, to the side and said, you know, I can't do this. Um, I've just lost the love of my life. I'm struggling. And absolutely, I understand. I said, can I call you for advice? And he always provided advice to me and support and guidance and what I can do next and what I should do to support my mom and how I'm kind of keep watch over her and make sure she was safe. 
And that's when my mom started resenting me <laughs> because I had the unfortunate task of of trying to ensure that she didn't get herself into too much trouble, which she did, unfortunately, over the years, numerous times. Um, I think the first time I had to go to a justice of the peace to get an arrest warrant issued, I was around the age of 20. And um, I remember sitting outside of um, City Hall where you had to go meet with the, the justice and explain your story and plead your case and provide them information, details, and evidence that they are either a threat to themselves, a threat to others. Um, and there's one other caveat that decides whether or not, but it was really easy to convince them based on her uh, medical history and um, what she was currently doing. That had to take quite a toll well, that was, to do that, let alone at 20 years old. And it's it's funny because while I was trying to decide or figure out if I was okay because of the possibility of having the genetic factors in myself, um, I had to shift because I didn't really have time to be self-indulgent and I didn't have, I had to kind of set aside my existential crisis because I had to deal with my mom mm -hmm. and, and support her and help her. Um, for years and years, decades, she fought me on it. She divorced me um, a number of times. She has called me every name in the book. Um, and eventually she passed away in 2013, but in the last, I would say five years of her life, she became too more accepting of the fact that she wasn't well and that she did need support and that I was there actually on her team and on her side as much as you can when you're mentally ill and started being a little bit more accepting of me getting her help. Don't get me wrong. There were still many peaks and valleys in those years, but, um, it was a really long road getting there and it was uh, full of tumultuous tales and a lot of humor because um, something my brother and I, I think, started doing as a coping mechanism is, is laughing and, and making light of it because either you're laughing about and, and making, not making jokes or making fun, but if you don't have a sense of humor about things, yeah, I think that you could wind up in fetal position in a corner, kind of crying, unable to function. So yeah. our method for dealing was with humor. And we've kind of carried that through our entire lives and our family's lives. Sarcasm and humor, for better or worse, are a big part of how we communicate. <laughs> Mixed in with a lot of caring and other things as well. Sure. But there's <laughs> always a little bit of underlying uh, smart aleckness <laughs> about our conversations and how we act. So did you? So, yeah. Did you and your mom ever find, and I hate the word normal, but did you ever find kind of a baseline for relating to one another? I think we, we eventually found a normal that we could both live with. Mm -hmm. I never really understood the full, the magnitude of what my mother experienced and where she was at different times in her life until after she passed away. Mm -hmm. um, something that um, my mom, she was diagnosed as uh, with schizoaffective disorder. So it's kind of a tricky blend of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and depression. And it changes and is constantly manifesting itself. And it's hard to treat with, with drugs because as people with mental health issues grow older, there are chemicals change and, you know, things that are effective one year might not be so effective the next. So I, I tried to, I became more understanding as I grew and learned. Um, of course, I had empathy and she understood that I wanted to, to help her and was there to support her. And she also became very involved in my kids' lives. Mm -hmm. So my kids were absolutely a, a, a safe place for her. She had an incredible relationship with both of them. And that is something I'm very grateful for. And they adore, I, they adored her. Um, and she doted on them um, in a way that she didn't dote on my brother and I. So um, while she was not the best mom, she did um, make up for it in spades with my children. So um, that that is a positive that came out of me kind of hanging in there and sticking to it because, because I was kind of helping her and, and trying to support her as best I could. I ended up bringing her to the same city that I lived in and she lived with me for a time, a short, short time. Um, but she was always within five minutes driving from my house so that 
I could make sure that if she needed my assistance, I could be there for her. Or if she needed to be taken to the hospital, I could ensure that she got the, the care that she needed as well. So I think we, we, we developed a normal. Um, it's not normal for other people and a lot of people. A lot of people would have seen our normal as absolutely out there, but it was normal for us and we got along really well. You know, we, mm -hmm. we had our, our rituals. We watched uh, a British soap opera called Coronation Street. <laughs> um, yeah, we had our things that we did together and we, we laughed a lot and my kids loved her and we got, they got to spend, you know, the first number of years with her, which is great. And I'm grateful for that. So, um, after she passed, however, I really kind of understood more about who she was as a person and her insecurities and the things that she struggled with and how she was so insecure and with her mental health issues, she was very paranoid and always requested all of her medical documents. So when she passed away and I was going through things, I came across numerous medical files. And again, I know the person that I am, I went through them and I learned a lot about her and the resentment turned into, I, I didn't resent her, you know, for most of her life, but it turned into a different kind of empathy and understanding and, and understanding where she was and it, the thing that makes me most sad is that i hope that she was in a good place at the end of her life because i know that she struggled all of her life um i know that my kids brought her a lot of joy i just i hope that that she was content in that peace so yeah kind of came full circle though most things do <laughs> many things yes. do <laughs> So it's true. how are you, are you vigilant about self-care to guard against your own expression of, am. of poor mental health or uh, is it never come up? I, how does that work for you? Yeah. While I was going through um, my experience and journey with my mom, there was a time where I started journaling and uh, the journals that I kept were mostly digital, but some were written in, you know, paper journals strewn around, you know, in different bedside tables and closets and boxes and such. And I put them all in a digital file and I locked them and I just kind of set them aside. So that was kind of my self-care while I was going through things. And I've always, I've always read a lot. Um, so that's always been a way for me to kind of un unwind and listen to music podcasts. Of course. <laughs> and uh, hanging out, I used to play a lot of sports. Uh, now that I'm a little bit older, my body is saying it's time to slow down on some of those sports. But um, hockey and baseball are really hard on your body when you get over 50. <laughs> so, um, so at one point, my kids asked me if they could read my journals because they really wanted to understand their grandmother and our relationship as we went through life together. And when I was younger, and they're both adults now. And I opened that file with the password and I started reading through it. And there were uh, 80 pages of typed single spaced journal entries. And I started reading through them. They were pretty raw. Some of them were very raw. And I started kind of putting those stories into a longer form that's a bit more palatable for uh, my kids. And then I was talking to a girlfriend of mine and she said, well, why don't you just make it into a memoir? You have such a, a great story. And there's an over, you know, an overreaching theme here that, that could impact people and could help somebody. And even if it helps one person, you know, it's worth, it's worth that. So now my, my self care exercises is to actually write. I, I find it to be really relaxing. I've taken some courses and I love doing it. And one day, my plan is to publish a memoir based on uh, those records of mine and my mom's journey together. That's going to be a great memoir. And I know we can go to your website and get on the mailing list and stay up to date and know when it's released. And that yes, will be in the show notes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm excited about it. I don't know um, how long it's going to take to actually finish that work. Um, it's it's an ongoing work. I have all of the stories. It's just making them into something that is readable and uh, 
something that someone can consume without going, I have no idea what this woman is talking about because it was a very disjointed and bumpy ride at some times. But sure. um, it may be who I am today. And I'm grateful for the experience in hindsight. Um, it's made me aware of taking care of myself and checking in on my mental health. And if I'm not having a great time to, you know, talk to somebody, call my doctor, call my nurse practitioner, you know, just find, you know, now that I have Google, that that's also very helpful. Um, and make sure that I'm just aware of kind of where I am mentally. The pandemic has not helped any of us as a population. And now it's even more important and prevalent for all of us to you know, kind of manage our self-care and manage and, and know where we are. And hopefully, if something good can come out of this pandemic, hopefully it's to lessen the stigma of mental health issues and have people understand that this, this isn't, it doesn't make people dangerous. It doesn't make them criminals. It just means that something's going on and they're still people and they still have feelings and they're still loving humans. And there are always going to be outliers, but for the most part, you know, mm -hmm. they just want to be understood. <laughs> now, having children is terrifying and it's wonderful and it's aggravating and it's joyful. It's all of those things wrapped up in the experience. Mm -hmm. How was it for you having children and raising them, knowing that this might be expressed in them? I've always kept an eye um, and, and communicated with them. Um, one of the things that I struggle with as a kid is I felt like I was always in the dark and I didn't know what was going on and I had to learn on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always worked really hard to keep lines of communication open with my own children in the hopes that if they are feeling or struggling with anything that they, they feel like they can come to me and talk to me about it. And they're adults now, they're, you know, 23 and 25, and they're both functioning. <laughs> they're great kids, you know, they have their goals and their dreams. And um, I wasn't, you know, sitting outside the courthouse having either one of them um, assess for mental health issues. So I'm grateful for that. And I think making sure that they're, they're happy and secure as, as young kids, I think was also a big part of it. Um, my mom suffered abuse when she was a kid and studies have shown now that a lot of those health issues stem from trauma as a child. So if you can, you know, work hard to eliminate trauma in your own children's lives, that might give them a step up and a step ahead in, in helping them to, to manage their own happiness and self-care going forward as adults. What mm -hmm. would you, what advice would you give to someone who's caring for someone else with mental illness? Be patient, be patient, be patient, be patient. Um, and if they're willing to communicate, just, you know, talk to them about how they're feeling. You talk to them like, like they're, they're people um, instead of children, because unless they're children, of course, <laughs> but um, and, and to have a sense of humor, you have to maintain a sense of humor. Um, life is funny and there are funny moments in, in tragic moments and, and difficult moments and, I think it makes everything a little bit easier. And if you can keep, you know, a sense of lightness about you and to take and take care of yourself, it makes everything a little bit easier to manage and deal with as you go through the rough patches. Um, and most importantly, don't forget to take care of yourself. Um, you can't take care of someone else unless you're taking care of you. That's huge. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I look forward to reading your memoir. So get it written <laughs> with you i'll be sure to send you an advanced copy so you can give me your your honest feedback <laughs> i would love to read it and i'd love to share it with the listeners too that's such a timely, not only a timely topic but gosh such an important topic mental illness isn't just one thing it's so many different things and even the same thing can manifest differently in different individuals but you know, you mentioned being patient and having a sense of humor. Some of those things are going to be universal in all of the different situations. And knowing that wisdom and those common truths, that will be really helpful. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Um, it's been an absolute honor to be a part of your podcast. Um, thank you. You you deal with so many fascinating and, and important topics. So I thank you very much for including me. And well, thank you. It, I appreciate it. You know, difficult things come up in life uncomfortable things come up in life. And if we try to pretend like they don't, we're doing ourselves and those around us a disservice. But when we can lean into them, overcome them, learn from them, share what we've learned with others, that's what changes us and changes the world. So this little podcast is hoping to be a part of that and you being present and sharing your story is a big part of it. So thank you. And maybe we'll come back and catch a where is she now update at some point. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. I think that would be uh, wonderful. And um, I look forward to it. All right. Be well. We'll talk soon. Thank you. You too. Take care, Melissa.